Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. Matthew Ho is a decorated Marine combat veteran of what we call our endless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's been a guest on the show numerous times. In 2009, he resigned his position with the State Department in Afghanistan under Obama to protest that ongoing war. And his resignation letter, by the way, was cited by the Council on Foreign Relations as an essential document. In 2010, he got the Ridenhauer Prize recipient for truth-telling. And his writing has appeared in too many journals to mention them all, or we wouldn't have any time to say anything to each other today. <laughs> now he's running for the U.S. Senate in North Carolina as a Green Party candidate. And Matt, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much, Mark. So let me begin by um, asking a question I know that probably you get asked a lot and can probably be really annoying, but I'll have to ask it anyway. Um, so you're in North Carolina. You're running in a state, uh, you're running as a Green Party candidate for the U.S. Mm -hmm. Senate. Um, it's a state that people look at when they look at the politics of America as one that teeters on the between Republican and Democrat, probably leaning more towards Republican in terms of victory in the, in mm -hmm. the coming election. I mean, that's, that's what most polls would say at the moment. And I'm saying that to say that some people, especially people who are part of the progressive world on the left, especially inside the Democratic Party, would say, look, we are facing the right-wing hordes who could seize power in this country. We saw what happened on January the 6th. If you run as a Green you ensure the right wing can take over the country. And a lot of people are going to ask that question. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, you know, and in a lot of people, uh, that's one of the first things I hear from right. particularly those attached to the Democratic Party uh, is that you're going to be a spoiler. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that. And I think there's a lot of finger pointing towards the Greens that, um, you know, you're going to be the next Ralph Nader, you're going to be your next Jill Stein. You know, and, and what I say to that is, look, Ralph Nader didn't make 300,000 registered Democrats vote for George H, George W. Bush in Florida in 2000. Jill Stein didn't make 8 million Obama voters uh, in, from 2012 vote for Donald Trump in 2016. You know, people, uh, a lot of this has got to do with the policies chosen by successive administrations, both Democrats and Republicans, that have impacted working families so negatively. Um, you know, in the sense of if I'm on the ballot in November, I will be the only candidate for U.S. Senate that North Carolinians can vote for who is in favor of Medicare for all, who is in favor of student medical debt cancellation, who is in favor of uh, ending the war on drugs, who's in favor of U.S. higher, higher education. I mean, on and on and on. I mean, the, the, the things that I am standing for and am committed to. Uh, the, that list that does not overlap with the Democrats is much greater than the list that does overlap with the Democrats. And these are life and death issues. You know, we've had hundreds of thousands of people die in this country because of a lack of access to health care during this pandemic. It already was a health care system that was broken and failing and causing misery across the country. You know, the Democrat in this race will not do anything to change our health care system. She just won't. You know, the same thing, too. We've had 100,000 people die of opioid overdose in this country. These are both things that have affected me personally, the health care and, and the, uh, the war on drugs in terms of friends and family, as well as uh, in my community, the effects that I've seen, the, 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 the deaths of despair, as they're called, right, because of a lack of access to health care. Because of a lack of, 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 of because of treating uh, substance abuse and addiction in this country as a criminal matter rather than a public health matter. So 100,000 people dead in a 12 month period from opioid overdose. And there is nothing that the Democratic Party will do about it. I mean, and, and on and on and on. We could be here all day just talking about the differences. So I, I think that's where I come to on this. I mean, there's other things too. I'm not a Democrat. I've never been a part of the Democratic Party. I'm a socialist. You know, the Green Party is the only party I've ever belonged to. Uh, you know, there are uh, aspects about this I think that people need to consider of that the two-party system, I really do believe, is why we are at where we are at in terms of an exasperation of identity politics that have brought about this right-wing, um, these right-wing hordes, as you have described, 
that are really based upon identity. Um, you know, and this is a very dangerous thing. So I just don't believe that continuing to invest in the system that got us here is going to deliver any results and changes. I'll, I'll say the same thing about the Supreme Court. For decades, the Democrats ran on the Supreme Court being the issue that will protect women. And we've seen how that, how that, how that, 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 that policy, how those, how that, uh, those campaigns, how that, uh, you know, how that actually turned out, you know, women are going to may lose the right to abortion in this country. And, you know, there are no Democrats who are saying really, we really mess this up. We have 50 years to codify Roe v. Wade, uh, into law. Instead of doing that, we chose to fundraise off of it every election cycle and scare people. And we still lost. So I, I think a lot of it, again, is, is, is the, my philosophy, where I come from as a socialist, as a Green Party member, the issues that I am running for, that I support, as well as, and too, the, the historical evidence that has gotten to us this point, you know, continuing to invest in the two-party system is only going to continue to produce what we are witnessing now. So let me let me ask a couple questions about what you just said yeah. that I think are really important here. And one is a, I'm just very curious. Um, let me start with one. There are three three specific things. One is when you call yourself a socialist, um, and and I'm I'm going to ask this question to someone who's called himself that since he was 15 years old, and I'm yeah. a lot older than that now. So. <laughs> So I, I, came, um, I, I, I mean, I came to it much later than you did, you know? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so but I, I'm glad, but I'm glad I'm here now, you know? So the question is, I, as someone who is um, a Marine combat veteran who served in these wars, um, I'm curious when you came to that and how you came to that. Yeah. You know, it's a really good question. I think it gets into really a, a great conversation about, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, establishment thinking in this country. Um, you know, I went to a very good public high school in New Jersey. I was the history honor student. You know, I went to a good private college. Um, I never read Chomsky, never read Zinn, never read uh, Angela Davis, never. I mean, like all these things, the most radical I ever read was probably Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading Cornell West when I was a sophomore in college, not because it was a, a, a part of my college uh, curriculum, but because I just happened to stumble upon his work and just being, you know, uh, it was a turning point for me, you know, this but is, still, this just, is before you became a Marine, right? This is before I became a Marine. Right, and, right, right, you know, right. but then too, I was so tied into the establishment stuff, Mark, right? You know, so like, even after I graduated college, before I joined the Marine Corps, when I'm working in finance, you know, I've got a subscription to the New York Times, I've got, you know, riding the bus to the, to the office in the mornings and the afternoons, I, I, I'm back home in the afternoons, you know, I, I've got my subscriptions to The Economist and The New Yorker, so all very establishment stuff. Um, and it is, um, you know, there's a, there's a conflict within me, uh, between what I'm being told is the right thing and what I'm feeling is the right thing. Um, you know, going to war, uh, seeing, uh, clearly with, with, uh, you know, through my own experience, uh, the effects that government can have seeing it here back in this country in terms of through uh, my own experiences, but both through neighbors and, and, and family and friends, the effects that government can have and realizing that so much of what our government chooses to do is violence based. Right. And oftentimes, and I will say this, that, you know, the, the economic policies of this country, which really, I believe, start before I was born, I was born in 1973. So beginning with Nixon, you have uh, very real policies in this country that directly impact workers, that directly uh, uh, skew uh, our economy. And I shouldn't say skew, but direct our economy in order to benefit corporations, banks, the wealthy. I mean, we have neoliberal policies, financialization policies that for 50 years have brought us to this point that more than half the people in this country are living paycheck to paycheck, 
right? You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I, it, it's the experience. And, and so this is how I arrive at this place. And then when I resigned in protest for my position with the State Department in, over the war in Afghanistan in 2009, and as I enter into the anti-war community, and then seeing the, the foundations of the anti-war community, and a lot of those texts, a lot of the, 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 the uh, uh, or, or organizations or individuals that, you know, have come to an anti-war uh perspective based upon this, you know, ideals of socialism that preach brotherhood and sisterhood, that preach internationalism, that preach cooperation. And then I'm able to actually look back and say, look, this actually is what the founders were talking about. Did they actually believe it or not? I'm not really sure. But in the sense of government for the people, I mean, we can get into a big debate about what our actual government looked like under the, you know, in, in the 1790s, early 1800s. But, you know, the, the concept of government for the people, um, you know, this is what socialism is, as well as too seeing the very real effects here on entire communities that are uh, have just been ruined um, by for-profit seeking corporations, by for-profit seeking utilities, by for-profit seeking healthcare system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just going kind to, of, the last two things we just talked about, let me kind of put them together in the context of what some people are thinking about when it comes to January 6th and what that meant in this country. Yeah. Um, and what people saw and what that kind of visceral attack meant on the U.S. Capitol and what it represented. And you talked a moment ago, a little bit ago, about identity politics in this country. And part of what you saw on January 6th, I think, is built around that and built about yeah. racism and built about other things that are that are are, are, are the, some of the diseases that are destroying this country from within. Right. Um, so when you see that, and, and, I, and, and some people say, look, the only way to stop that some people might argue is to is to bring a broad spectrum of people together from liberal Democrats to people on the left to people in communities of color from all perspectives to say we got to stop this onslaught from the right. And I'm I guess I'm particularly obsessed with the moment because we're producing a series now on that mm -hmm. on the right and watching its power and what it really means, this well-armed power that is being faced, that we face in this country. So how do you, just to talk, respond to that in terms of your candidacy, what you see, where you see America going, why that is happening at the moment, and how you respond to that. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I kind of view the two-party system as these like, you know, spinning brushes, right? That as they, uh, they spin, uh, they create greater distance from themselves, right? So the, the, the problem with the identity politics is that it continually exasperates uh, the tension, um, the rhetoric, you know, leads into violence. And I, I think that's further uh, complicated by the technological and media advances of the last 30 years, cable news, social media, uh, talk radio, you know, so much of that is based around identity politics. We, we have very little issues based campaigning and even less philosophy based campaigning. You know, when I was a young kid, I asked my dad what the difference between Democrats and Republicans were. And he, you know, gave a, a pretty good answer that Republicans believe in smaller government Democrats believe in bigger government, you know, and gave a pretty fair answer that I don't think, you know, you can really look at now and say, oh, yeah, no, it fits perfectly, you know, and, and much of, of what, um, you know, is espoused by politicians from both parties has little to do with their political or economic philosophies. And often you can't even understand what those are for, for these candidates. You know, January 6th, I think, um, you know, the, the, the mob that attacked, uh, the Capitol building, uh, which had some real terrorist elements within it, you know, I, I think it's complicated and it's layered, right? So that you had some people who got caught up in the moment, you had elements of this becoming a crowd that became a mob that became out of control. And then of course you had some very real elements that saw this as an opportunity to stage a coup. Um, yeah, it, it's just insane, the same as the 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump against Joe Biden. I mean, he got how many more millions of votes than he did in 2016 and 2020? I mean, it, I, I think to you and I, Mark, to people listening, I mean, it's just that makes no sense. And when you look at the information we know about these people, they vote for a lot of different reasons. There are some racists in that. But again, 8 million uh, Obama voters uh, voted for Trump. You know, and when you look at the demographics on that, you see the key states 
uh, where those voters shifted, um, a lot of those voters were in households that were earning less than $50,000 a year. I mean, so there's a real economic aspect of this. There's also two, as I alluded to before, that, that, that you know, I mentioned earlier, but also the, this, these deaths of despair. And there was a really great study uh, by researchers from the University of Minnesota and from Harvard that looked at, um, you know, the count, the states that put Trump over the edge in 2016, the counties in those states that that gave him those states. And what they found was a very real anti-war sentiment in those counties, leading them to, to, to conclude that, uh, you know, Trump's pronounced anti-war rhetoric, which he didn't actually do or believe, uh, but he, he 2016, he was saying, led many of those counties in those key states to go for him because those counties had disproportionately high casualty numbers because they were in where National Guard and Reserve units have been based. I mean, so you have these impacts on our community that I think a lot of people uh, you know, who are living, um, you know, pretty well to do lives may not see. Now it's complicated though, because we also know that Trump voters aren't all poor. Trump voters aren't all, uh, you know, suffering from, um, you know, these, these issues that I'm speaking about. You know, there are plenty well to do Trump voters. A lot of the people who are at the stop the steal, uh, attack on the Capitol, ha- ha, you know, we're well off, we're business owners, you know? So there's a lot, to this, I, I think with a candidacy like mine is that you are trying to break away from the identity, trying to, to break away from um, the uh, ma- narrative, uh, the binary Mac- Manichaean good versus evil narrative and say, hey, what are the problems affecting us here? What are the problems that are systemic? What are the problems that are real life and death issues? You know, I, I don't think there's anything that separates me from the Democrats, say, that isn't a life and death issue. And that's not hyperbole. You know, it's also, too, I think with the platform that we have, it's popular. I, I, on my issues page on my website, you know, I don't think there's an issue on there that doesn't have majority public opinion support or that... Um, does not have plurality support. The only people who can call what we are advocating for on this campaign in the Green Party on a larger extent, you know, radical or fringe, are, are, are really those in D.C. whose donors are going to be affected by this. You know, so I think a lot of this is gets back to, I'm taking a long way to get to this, Mark, but gets back <laughs> to this idea of direct democracy. Right, right. Right? Why did they attack uh-huh. the Capitol? Right. You mean you, you can you can come up with individual answers, but as a whole, they felt that they were being left out of the system. They felt that Donald Trump was the one who was protecting them from the encroaches of a corrupt of a corrupt <laughs> political system. You know, he was going to drain the swamp. He was going to lock up crooked Hillary, et cetera, et cetera. This is all stuff that people feel. And this idea then of connecting people back to their democracy, you know, the From My Issues page, the very top one is about ending political corruption and strengthening our democracy. You know, and we have uh, we have a terrible issue down here in North Carolina with gerrymandered districts because the Republicans control state houses. But on the same side, too, they just gerrymandered districts in New York, Illinois. Uh, districts are gerrymandered, you know, both states for Democrats. Certainly, you look at what's happening in Minnesota uh, uh, now with, with, with that young man, uh, Amir Locke, uh, I believe his name is, who was right. murdered by the police while he was sleeping. Minis- Minneapolis is a Democratic-controlled town. You know, look at what happened in California, where the California legislature, uh, Democrats have, what, about a 75% hold on that legislature, and they yanked single-payer health care. Right. I mean, so the solution is not one particular party, particularly when the parties are so beholden to money. The solution is getting into getting a political system that is representative of people's ideas and beliefs and philosophies. You know, one of the other issues, too, with the whole uh, way people vote is a lot of times people get to the voting box and they've already uh, put themselves through convolutions by you know, entering into a lesser of two evil political system, they're already, uh, you know, not voting their conscience, not voting their beliefs, right? Not voting what they want to see, but rather making a decision at the at the voting booth, at the ballot box, uh, akin to like, you know, they're, as if they're a Fox News or MSNBC pundit. So you said a couple of things I'm really interested like to explore here in terms of your campaign and where you see things going. And one had to do with um, what you said about the 8 million voters who voted for Obama 
uh, and then voted for Trump. But there was another 8 million voters, I think, who decided not to vote at all, who voted for Obama as well right. on top of that, which was probably right. right. that Trump was, could win this election, the last election. I mean, not the 2016 election, excuse me. Before I get into that, I, w- I want to talk about what, just, just a strategic question for you. So you're not on the ballot yet. No. Right? No. Right? So what does it take for you to get on the ballot? Because we all know, I mean, if you look at the history of stuff, writing is, it's hard enough to be a third party candidate in North Carolina and other places, let alone not being on the ballot. So how do you get on the ballot? What does it mean for you to get on the ballot? How do you get there? Great. Yeah. And thank you, Mark, for bringing it up because the folks on my uh, campaign collective uh, would would have beaten me over the head if, because I probably would have forgot to bring this up, you know, because if we're not on the ballot, none of this matters. Right. You know, so, um, you know, the, uh, um, yeah. So to get on the ballot here in North Carolina, um, as a, uh, a quote unquote new party, uh, we need to have, uh, 15,000 signatures, roughly 15,000 signatures, which, you know, the rule of thumb is that, you know, it's 70% verification rate. So 15,000 really means 20,000 signatures. Right. Um, every state is different. If we were doing this in Virginia or in Florida, we would need no signatures. If we were doing this in South Carolina, we would need 10,000 signatures it really is, is different state by state. Ballot access is a way that of course the two major parties control, uh, the system. Um, it's very difficult. It, it'd be difficult. It's difficult to get signatures uh, without a pandemic going on, you know. And so one of the pro- issues we have, of course, is we've had two years of, of uh, public health messaging of, of stay away from people. Right. So as you as our folks are out there trying to get signatures, a little harder than you normally. A lot of people don't like people approaching them with clipboards and a pen anyway. Right. I mean, it's so it's not the easiest thing to do. But again, in a pandemic, the other thing, too, that we have a, a problem with is a lot of the events that we thought we could be at to get signatures were canceled because of COVID. So if something like Charlotte Pride March, you know, I mean, right? COVID, Delta, then Omicron takes that out. You know, so it is, it's hard it, 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 and it's expensive. Um, and um, it's, it's, you know, we have a hundred counties here in North Carolina. So again, rather than going to one centralized location, we have to send each petition sheet for each county to each of the 100 counties and deal with 100 separate county uh, election boards as opposed to dealing kind of with one central state board of elections representative on this. So you can imagine for a party that is made up of volunteers, as we all are, all of us with our lives, families, everyone on my, everyone who's a part of this is working full time, you know, um, you know, it's not that easy. So it's, but again, it's worthwhile though, because if, if this campaign, our campaign is not on the ballot, North Carolinians won't have the opportunity to vote for Medicare for all. They won't have an opportunity to vote for real climate change action, you know, won't have an opportunity uh, to vote for, uh, uh, you know, all the things we ran about before, universal higher education, student debt cancellation, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 public broadband access, you know, not this nonsense where we'll give you a voucher or a coupon, you know, but actually a campaign that actually, we have large parts of North Carolina that has very serious restrictions in terms of their broadband internet access. You know, if anything, the last two years have taught us that broadband internet access, it's not about just being able to watch your TV shows on Netflix. This is, this is real, this is utility stuff. This, this is a public utility, you know I mean? So this is, this is, again, gets back to this idea of why are we socialists? You know, because we believe that coming together, you know, and in the government being responsive to the public ensures a better result for the entire public than a government that is beholden to special interests or particularly an economic philosophy that is meant to uh, make the most money as opposed to ensuring the public good. So... uh... There's so much to talk about it. I mean, it's just a little time. I have to do this more than once just to get into, see how this campaign unfolds, especially with your getting on the ballot, which I think is critical to getting a message out um, and getting votes in. But one of the things I've, I, you know, I, I as, as someone who spent part of a, his lifetime uh, as an organizer um, and actually bringing people who were 
former Klansmen and racists together with with the black community mm-hmm. to, to 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 fight similar fights and then over and then that way kind of deal with the racism which is what happened, whether it was a young patron in Chicago or organizing tenants in Baltimore or wherever that happened to be, um, that I'm curious how you take your message that way. Yeah. To people to say, this is what we have, this is how we have to come together. This is, this is why single payer is important. This is, this is how we trans, this is how we transition from a fossil economy, economy to a new different a clean economy um, without you losing your money, your benefits, and your job. I mean, you know right. what I'm saying? I mean, so, right. so talk a bit about what, what your thoughts on how you do that. On how I, you I, I think the focus, the focus is on working families. The focus is on, um, you know, those people, the huge segments of the population that a lot of what we were discussing about Trump voters, you know, went from Obama to Trump, people who are, are feeling uh, the economic catastrophe that has been delivered upon them by 50 years of official government policy, reversing that, right? It, hey, it, it's only fair and just that workers can have the same benefits that the banks and the corporations and the wealthy had. But one of the things I think, Mark, we, we come across with, and, and you know, I, one of the things that really always influenced me with, was FDR's second Bill of Rights, Yes. Um, this idea, the uh, you know, and of course, uh, you know, what we saw with uh, the New Deal, the Great Society, uh, uh, you know, this idea that as a people, we should all have the same fundamental starting place, but also to the same fundamental infrastructure, you know, and understanding, you know, and again, and this, this will be again, I keep uh, saying it o- over and over again, but like I'll be the only candidate on the ballot who believes that healthcare, housing, education, and livable wages are human rights. You know, I mean, and so what does that actually mean then? If those are my beliefs, if those are my ph- that's my philosophy, what does that translate into? And that translates into everybody, no matter if, if it's including Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they have the same fundamental rights to those things that everyone else does. You know, so it's universality. So when it, it when you're talking with uh, whether it, 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 it's 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 black voters, Latino voters, white voters, uh, you know, Asian voters, whatever, it, it's about making sure that they understand that this universality applies to everyone. That these are fundamental human rights. In understanding that where we got to today, economically and socially in this country, was no accident. This didn't happen because of like some kind of free market magic nonsense. Didn't just grow organically our, our economy in, in this way. You know, uh, the fact that 55% of, of, of people in this country can't afford a $1,000 emergency, that didn't just happen because that's the way that God wills it. You know, I mean, it happened because of official policies by the U.S. government over decades. So it's talking about reversing that. You know, as well as too, I think there's there's some elements to this uh, of the education of look. You know, we've all been victims of a divide and conquer system by the two party uh, forever. I mean, forever. I mean, this goes back to before the founding of the republic. You know, the idea that oh my god, you know what? If these black slaves and these poor white people ever get together, we're going to be in a lot of trouble, right? So I mean, this goes back hundreds of years. You know, and it's a very effective and we, you know, I, I really come to this personally because I took part in that because divide and conquer is what the U.S. uses in its foreign and military policy. So I took part in that t- kind of stuff overseas and I see how destructive it is. You know, I see how it's a self-reinforcing cycle when you do that uh, of, of one side being pitted against the other. You know, where does that end up? And I think where it ends up is just as you were saying to Mark with January 6th, the last stand of the white man. Right. Which is how a lot of those people, you know, if you're part of the Oath Keepers or the three percenters, how you would see it. You know, I mean, I, I, there are people at January 6th who were, you know, uh, uh, afraid they would lose their business because of over government regulation or something like that. But a lot of them were for the reasons I just mentioned and as we've spoken about. So, uh, you know. I, I, I think when you're approaching, and we, we have a very real commitment in this campaign, we have 100 counties in North Carolina, 80 of them are rural counties. Uh, these rural counties are losing population. About half the counties, even as North Carolina grew quite dramatically in population over the last census, an uh, increase of more than 10%, half of our counties lost population. You know, and, and why? You know, what's happening out there? Well, 
you know, the people, the, the, the people aren't, there, there are no services. People aren't connected to things. You can't, you can't have broadband. The schools are underfunded. You got to drive 75 minutes to get to a hospital and then you're going to have to wait for eight hours. You know, that alone, you can't afford healthcare, you know, so you have to go to the emergency room. I mean, these are a lot of the things that people in those people in those rural areas, you know, they see a politician once every election cycle and that's it. You know, uh, just as many as our, 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 our sisters and brothers in urban areas, same kind of thing. A politician shows up, you know, and then they see them whenever it's time to go ask for votes again and they're left out. So that's another part of this besides the universality, the, the understanding of, of these things as human rights, the understanding of how we got here historically, but also, too, you know, th this, this, this notion that, look, this is supposed to be a government for you. And we are a party committed to that. There's so much more to talk about, Matt. And I, I look forward to doing this more down the campaign trail and getting more specifics and see how this unfolds. And by the way, so how do folks get in touch with you and the campaign? Let's get that out there now. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. We're, uh, uh, the website is MatthewHoferSenate.org. Uh, last name spelled H-O-H. So it's MatthewHoferSenate.org. Uh, please go to the website. Please donate. You know, one of the things about the ballot access is it's incredibly expensive. It's a way to keep people off the ballot. I mean, you're, you're talking anywhere from each signature costs us between three and seven dollars. Wow. Uh, I mean, so when you're talking about getting we need 20,000 signatures to be safe at a minimum, we need to raise sixty thousand dollars then because, you know, we have to it also too. we want to as a campaign, we want to practice what we espouse. So if we have people out there working for us. We want to pay them a just wage. We want to pay them 15, and I prefer to pay them $20 an hour in order to do this, right? I mean, like, so we, we kind of, you know, so MatthewHoferSant.org, please donate. Uh, you can sign up to volunteer. Uh, you can join the campaign that way. Please uh, share it with friends and family. Uh, as a third party, we're a bit locked out of the uh, uh, corporate traditional media, which has come as no surprise to anyone. Um, the uh, uh, as well as too, we're on all the social media stuff. So you can look us up on Facebook. You can look us up on Twitter, uh, Instagram, TikTok. So if you subscribe to TikTok, I'm sure at some point they'll make me do a dance on tip TikTok. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, please uh, follow those, like them, share them, do all that good social media stuff because that really helps us out. Matthew, thanks so much for joining. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Hey, thanks so much, Mark. Good luck on the campaign trail, brother. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. It was great to have you all with us. And you can find links to Matthew Ho's campaign on the Steinish website here at The Real News. Uh, and check it out. We'll be talking some more down the campaign trail. And please let me know what you think about what you heard today. And what you'd like us to cover, you just write to me at mss at therealnews.com. And as those of you who have written me know, I'll write you right back. And again, it's good to have you all with us. And a important reminder here that Bill Fletcher Jr. and I will be producing a series on the rise of the right wing in America coming up in March that you do not want to miss. And we'll be hearing more about that coming up in the next few weeks. And uh, you really want to be take part in that. So for Dwayne Gladden... Stephen Frank and the crew here at The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care.